Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, Idaho. I hope you're having a wonderful Christmas and New Year. Thank you for joining us for the 2023 Local Yokel Idaho Christmas episode. Keeping with the tradition, we did a Christmas episode last year, and I thought, why not let's keep doing it and make it a standard tradition and do it again here. Also, we'll be taking a week pause of producing episodes, mainly to give me and John some time to enjoy the holiday, but also to give us some time to get ready for the legislative session and other projects and housekeeping and just general stuff that's going on with the podcast. But with that said, you'll be seeing us next year, so I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the bit of 2023, and we'll see you in 2024. As for the layout of this year's program, be very similar to last year's if you listen to it. If not, here's a little refresher. We'll have 10 interesting facts about Christmas, a reading of the Bible story of Christmas, two speeches. This year we'll have one presidential speech and another from the Queen of England, and then a closing prayer to close out the program. With any further ado, we'll jump straight into it. Starting off with our Christmas facts, our first one here, the first recorded Christmas celebration reportedly happened in Rome on December 25th, 336 AD. Then number two, some of you may know this, some of you might not, so I decided to keep this in from last year. Jingle Bells was originally a Thanksgiving song. You have that right. It was not always the holiday one we think of for all of Christmas and the hot chocolate and the gifts. It's actually one originally thought for Thanksgiving, which there's a couple other ones that are like that. And I kind of want to go researching for those. But staying with the holiday there, number three, Abraham Lincoln did not give a Christmas speech during his presidency. I actually went to go look out for that because I wanted to actually read his Christmas speech because most presidents have that. Mainly because of the fact that Christmas did not become a national holiday until 1870, five years after Lincoln's death. Which, until then, it was considered a normal workday, which is something that I didn't know much about, and I know John was kind of surprised when we were researching this. And then number four, the biggest shopping day of the year is not Black Friday, but the two days before Christmas. Which, if you guys listened to the main show that we did that came out on Sunday... You'll know that I'm kind of going to be in that crowd this year as we're recording this on Wednesday. And then number five, kind of an Idaho-related Christmas one there. Idaho's first governor, George L. Shoup, was officially inaugurated on December 24th, 1890. Kind of a fun one there. Number six, candy canes started in Germany. Thank you, the Germans, for that. Also, speaking of candy-related things, we come to number seven. According to CandyStore.com, Idaho residents are particularly partial to M&M's during the holiday seasons. Personally, I like the Hershey Kisses. Those are my favorite there. Number eight, Americans reportedly consume more than 135 million pounds of eggnog during the Christmas season. That's all for you guys. I don't have anything against eggnog, but I am not contributing to that because I barely have it. Granted, if there was tea, yes, I would hopefully be making a sizable dent. And then number nine, also kind of coming back to Idaho here, and this is one I didn't know. There's always these interesting things. There's a town in Idaho named Santa. While it doesn't have a large Christmas display as one would guess, the old post office is decorated in Christmas lights and festive window paint, and they have also have a custom stamp that you can get there that is from Santa, Idaho. And then lastly, we come to number 10. The three traditional colors of Christmas are a symbol of Christ. The red is of the blood of Jesus, green for his resurrection, and the gold for his title of King of Kings. Now, the reason we celebrate Christmas is found in the Bible, and we'll be reading from Matthew chapter 1, verses 15 to 25, and Matthew chapter 2. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, 
but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. In 1945, on December 24th, at 5.15 p.m., Harry S. Truman gave this Christmas speech. Now, you will hear some more related comments in this speech due to the nature of World War II having just finished in September of that year. Ladies and gentlemen and listeners of the radio audience, this is the Christmas that a war-weary world has prayed for through long and awful years with peace come joy and gladness. The gloom of the war years fades as once more we light the national community Christmas tree. We meet in the spirit of the first Christmas when the midnight choir sang the hymn of joy, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Let us not forget that the coming of the Savior brought a time of long peace to the Roman world. It is therefore fitting for us to remember that the spirit of Christmas is the spirit of peace, of love, of charity to all men. From the manger of Bethlehem came a new appeal to the minds and hearts of men. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. In love which is the very essence of the message of the Prince of Peace, the world would find a solution for all its ills. I do not believe there is one problem in this country or in the world today which could not be settled if approached through the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. The poet's dream, the lesson of priest and patriarch, and the prophet's vision of a new heaven and a new earth— all are summoned up in the message delivered in the Judean hills beside the Sea of Galilee. Would that the world would accept that message in this time of its greatest need. This is a solemn hour. In the stillness of the eve of the nativity, when the hopes of mankind hung on the peace that was offered to the world nineteen centuries ago, it is but natural 
while we survey our destiny, that we give thought also to our past, to some of the things which have gone into the making of our nation. You will remember that St. Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, and his companions, suffering shipwreck, cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Happily for us, whenever the American ship of state has been storm-tossed, we have always had an anchor to the windward. We are met on the south lawn of the White House. The setting is a reminder of St. Paul's four anchors. To one side is the massive pile of the Washington Monument, fit symbol for our first anchor. On the opposite end of Potomac Park, is the memorial to another of the anchors which we see when we look astern of the ship of state. Abraham Lincoln, who preserved the union that Washington wrought. Between them is the memorial to Thomas Jefferson, the anchor of democracy. On the other side of the White House, in bronze, rides Andrew Jackson, fourth of our anchors, the pedestal of his monument bearing his immortal words, our federal union, it must be preserved. It is well in this solemn hour that we bow to Washington, Jefferson, Jackson, and Lincoln as we face our destiny with its hopes and fears, its burdens and its responsibilities. Out of the past we shall gather wisdom and inspiration to chart our future course. With our enemies vanquished, we must gird ourselves for the work that lies ahead. Peace has its victories no less hard won than success at arms. We must not fail or falter. We must strive without ceasing to make real the prophecy of Isaiah. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. In this day, whether it be far or near, the kingdoms of this world shall become indeed the kingdom of God, and he will reign for ever and ever, Lord of lords and King of kings. With that message, I wish my countrymen a Merry Christmas and joyous days in the new year. On November 4th, 1952, just a little bit early for Christmas, Queen Elizabeth gave her first speech to her nation in 1952. She did this just before she took the throne. You'll notice some of that in her speech as we go forward here. Each Christmas at this time, my beloved father broadcast a message to his people in all parts of the world. Today I am doing this to you who are now my people. As he used to do, I am speaking to you from my own home, where I am spending Christmas with my family and let me say at once how I hope that your children are enjoying themselves as much as mine are on a day which is especially the child's festival, kept in honor of the child born of Bethlehem nearly 2,000 years ago. Most of you to whom I am speaking will be in your own homes, but I have a special thought for those who are saving their country in distant lands far from their families. Wherever you are, either at home or away, in snow or in shine, I give you my affectionate greetings with every good wish for Christmas and New Year. At Christmas, our thoughts are always full of our homes and our families. This is the day when members of the same family try to come together, or if separated by distance or events, meet in spirit and affection by exchanging greetings. But we belong, you and I, to a far larger family. We belong, all of us, to the British Commonwealth and the Empire that immense union of nations with our home set in all the four corners of the earth. Like our own families, it can be a great path for good, a force which I believe can be an immeasurable benefit to all humanity. My father and my grandfather before him worked all our lives to unite our peoples even more closely and to maintain its ideals, which were so near to their hearts. I shall strive to carry on this work. Already you have given me strength to do so. For since my ascension ten months ago, your loyalty and affection have been an immense support and encouragement. I want to take this Christmas Day, my first opportunity to thank you with all my heart. Many brave problems and difficulties confront us all, but with a new faith in the old, splendid beliefs given to us by our forefathers, and the strength to venture beyond the safeties of the past, 
I know we shall be worthy of our duty. Above all, we must keep alive the conscious spirit of adventure that is the finest quality of youth. And by youth, I do not just mean those who are young in years. I mean to all those who are young in heart, no matter how old they may be. The spirit will still flourish in this old country and in all the young countries of our commonwealth. On this broad foundation, let us set out to build a true knowledge of ourselves and our fellow man, to work for tolerance and understanding among the nations, and to use the tremendous forces of science and learning for the betterment of man's lot upon this earth. If we can do these three things with courage, with generosity, and with humility, then surely we shall achieve that peace on earth, goodwill toward men, which is the eternal message of Christmas and the desire of us all. At my coronation next June, I shall dedicate myself anew to your service. I shall do so in the presence of a great congregation, drawn from every part of the Commonwealth and Empire, while millions outside Westminster Abbey will hear the promise and the prayers being offered up within the walls, and see much of the ancient ceremony in which kings and queens before me have taken part through century upon century. I will be keeping it all as a holiday, but I want to ask you all, whatever your religion may be, to pray for me on that day, to pray that God would give me the wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promise I shall be making, and that I will faithfully serve him and you all all the days of my life. May God bless and guide you through the coming year. Hope you liked these speeches and they were edifying and encouraging and fulfilling to your soul. I put links down in the description below so you can read them in their full totality and exactness if you want to read them for yourself. There's also definitely recordings of them online so you can hear them done by far better speakers than maybe me. Now coming to our last part of this, as we close this year, I want to give a prayer because at the end of the day, all authority, all blessings, all things come from the Lord. I truly believe that. And so I want to end this year as we come to a close here with the podcast and all the wonderful things we've done this year with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful blessing that you've given us with this invention, which is the internet that allows us to quickly and easily communicate and to do it in affordable means that I, I don't need to go through some radio station and talk to some manager and they have to like my idea and all these different things. No, I can sit down. I can spend a couple dollars, have the microphone, and I can record it and it can go out to all these people. I hope throughout this last year, Lord, I and John have hopefully been able to bring knowledge that people wouldn't have otherwise known to have been a wonderful service in their life, that we may have... um, just overall educated and helped be a means that people would be able to better spend the time that the Lord has given them in their lives on the things that the Lord is calling them to. Please help us as we all go into this next year on the podcast, the channel here, that our actions would glorify you, that they would give honor and praise to your name, Lord, and that we would be fruitful in our endeavors, that all we do with this podcast would be useful and edifying for the viewer, And as I said earlier, give honor and praise to your name, Lord. Please be with the listener that as they go into this next year, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would comfort them, that you would support them. And if there are areas that they are needing to grow, that they would grow and that you would be alongside them, that you would encourage them and uplift them. And vice versa for all the things in my life or John's life, that you would be with us as well, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us understanding and discernment that you would give us the wisdom of knowing what is true and what is right and then how to apply that, that you would give us the discipline to then take that and use that in stride, that you would then give us the confidence to act accordingly with it, Lord. Please bless this coming year, and thank you for all the many blessings that the viewers have given us and that hopefully we have given them. In your name we pray, amen. With that said, thank you for listening this whole last year, if you have, the whole way through. I hope you all have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Until next year, everyone, take care.